Please welcome Helen Johnson from the University of Oxford. Helen received an undergraduate degree in physics and meteorology and a PhD in physical oceanography from both from the University of Reading. She spent some time as a postdoc with Chris Garrett in Canada before returning to the UK as a Royal Society University Research Fellow. She's been in Oxford since 2007 and received full, full professorship in ocean and climate science in 2020. In terms of AMOC activities, Helen is the PI of a new 1.6 million pound and $500,000 Snapdragon project, which is joint funded by the UK Natural Environment Research Council and the US National Science Foundation. This project involves colleagues in 10 institutions across the UK and US and funds, early, and funds eight early career scientists. Helen also served on the scientific steering committees for the Access OSNAP Rapid Joint Science Meeting in 2017, the International AMOC Meeting in 2018, and the Royal Society Meeting that is postponed to 2022. So today, Helen is here to present a summary of the paper that she led as part of the AGU Special Collection entitled, Recent Contributions of Theory to Our Understanding of the AMOC. We are very happy to have you here today, Helen. Please go ahead when you are ready. Thanks so much, Jenny, and thanks everyone for taking the time to uh, to be here today. So over the last decade or two, the new um, observational arrays in the North Atlantic, together with a, a new generation of ocean and climate models, have provided some intriguing insights into the um, Atlantic Meridional Overturning Circulation, the AMOC, as we've heard in previous uh, webinars. And theoretical models have provided a dynamical framework for understanding those new observations and the results of complex models. And so what we tried to do in this paper was review these theoretical model uh, contributions and to kind of provide a, a kind of um, uh, an update on our conceptual understanding of, of how the AMOC works. We tried to encapsulate the key processes um, important for the AMOC mean state and variability in this uh, schematic that was produced by, by Huey Graphics. So this paper was written with the, the help of four uh, co-authors to whom I'm very grateful, uh, listed here in the bottom left. I should also thank Hatta de Boer, who persuaded me to give an invited review talk at the 2017 IAPSO meeting, on which the very first draft of this uh, review paper was based. So I thought I'd start with um, uh, a slide that just shows what we covered in the paper. So we chose to focus on advances over the last decade or so. So since the beginning of the um, the kind of modern observational era, if you like, kind of uh, rapid array onwards. Um, and we focused on the North Atlantic deep water cell. We took quite a broad definition of theoretical models, um, including analytical models, conceptual models, and a subset of kind of idealized numerical simulations. And we didn't get into the mathematical details of each model, um, focusing instead on the insights that they provided, both uh, individually and collectively. Much of the paper focused on the mean AMOC, and then the latter part of the paper, we looked at what we'd learned from theory about the detection and meridional propagation of AMOC anomalies. Now, in 20 minutes, it's obviously going to be impossible for me to cover all of this. So what I'd like to do um, instead is just to focus on some key themes uh, running through the paper. So these are themes and questions that have influenced those constructing theoretical models of the AMOC over the last decade, and I've listed them here. Um, so the first theme here is, is about the role of the wind in both hemispheres um, in determining the AMOC, uh, and this includes its interaction with buoyancy forcing. Uh, the second theme is, is kind of a move away from a zonally average 2D picture towards representations and geometries that capture uh, more of the fundamentally 3D aspects of the circulation. So I'll provide some examples of some of those. There has, of course, been something of a debate on the degree to which water mass transformation in the ocean interior is important, or whether the circulation in the Atlantic sector is essentially adiabatic. Uh, now that remains an open question that I'll touch on. And then I'll uh, briefly mention the multiple lines of evidence that make it clear that eddies uh, in both hemispheres, especially at high latitudes, are a fundamental part of, of AMOC dynamics. So I'll just highlight a few papers to give you a flavor of these themes. This comes with the, the, the caveat, the warning, if you like, that I'm not aiming to be inclusive here in the, in the talk. It'll reflect a bit of a bias in terms of what I'm interested in. So I really apologize if your paper or your favorite paper um, doesn't get a mention. So I'm gonna begin by talking about the role of the wind. And that starts with the inclusion of the Southern Hemisphere wind forcing in theoretical models of the AMOC. So I guess any listeners younger than me might not remember a time when these winds blowing over the, the Southern Ocean weren't a part of the story and, the, and the, um, their role in bringing up North Atlantic deep water along icepicknels in the Southern Ocean. 
But the first uh, analytical model to um, incorporate these Southern Ocean winds and their effect was um, the model by Nana Desikin in 1999, building on the ideas published by Togweiler and Samuels a few years earlier. And these are, you know, obviously a standard feature of, of theoretical models of the, of the AMOC now. And, and many recent models have focused on the relative importance of wind and buoyancy forcing and this extent to which the AMOC can be adiabatic, flowing along isopycnals in the interior um, uh, rather than mixing up across isopycnals uh, uh, within the Atlantic sector itself. The potential for an adiabatic pole to pole overturning circulation was clearly illustrated in this paper by Wolf and Chessie. They used a zonally averaged analytical model in combination with coarse and high resolution uh, numerical simulations to show that in a single ocean basin connected to a reentrant channel, it's possible to have an adiabatic circulation um, provided you have two, uh, two things. The first of these is a, is a thermally indirect wind driven overturning circulation in the reentrant channel. So a way of lifting dense water up to the surface without transforming its density. And then the second thing is a set of outcropping isopycnals that are shared um, between the two hemispheres. And you can see this adiabatic circulation here in the solid arrows. It flows along isopycnals in the interior and the only place where there's water mass transformation is in the uh, surface mix layer. And of course, in the limit of weak diapycnal interior diffusion, the net overturning and therefore the northward heat flux uh, must be dominated by this adiabatic cell. So there are other papers there um, that I'd encourage you to go and have a look at. Of course, once you acknowledge that southern hemisphere winds play a crucial role in the overturning circulation, it's difficult to consider the mid-depth North Atlantic deep water cell in isolation from the abyssal Antarctic bottom water cell. And there have been several idealised models that have looked at the interaction between the two cells. Shakespeare and Hogg have a nice three layer version of Gnana Deskin's model, but the one I'm showing here is um, a model from Nicaragua and Vallis in 2012. Now, this model is only analytically tractable in the adiabatic limit, um, but I'm showing it because it's the first theory I'm aware of for zonally average stratification and overturning as continuous functions of depth and latitude that includes both adiabatic and diabatic components. It matches solutions in three regions, the circumpolar channel, the isopycnal outcrop region in the north and the basin in between. And it agrees very well with the results of 3D numerical simulations in a single basin domain with a reentrant channel to the south. In this model and in Shakespeare and Hogg, the overturning scales linearly with the Southern Ocean wind, as well as exhibiting a more classical um, Kappa to the two thirds scaling when the winds are weak. Other studies have taken a different approach to looking at this combined influence of wind and buoyancy forcing and moved on from the zonally average picture to allow stratification to vary zonally as well as meridionally. And what this does is it allows for wind to play a more complex role in determining the effectiveness of buoyancy forcing. So the paper I'm showing here is one uh, by Mike Bell in 2015, uh, which balances water mass transformation due to surface heat loss in the, in the North Atlantic here with uh, buoyancy gain uh, due to wind-driven shoaling of isopycnals in the South Atlantic just north of, of Drake Passage. In this paper, the overturning depends, again, relatively linearly on the range of southern hemisphere winds and on the southernmost latitude where buoyancy um, uh, is lost in the northern hemisphere, which is related to this uh, constraint of having to have isopycnals out outcrops shared between the two hemispheres. This move away from the zonal average is symptomatic of a broader trend in theoretical models, many of which now attempt to represent the 3D aspects of the circulation. And it's becoming increasingly clear that we probably need to think about more than one basin. Now, the evidence for this, part of the evidence for this, of course, comes from observations. I'm showing here a schematic from the paper by Tally in 2013, which showed that um, much of the North Atlantic deep water, which upwells in the Southern Ocean, is then exported to depth as Antarctic bottom water and must diffusively up well in other basins if it's going to rejoin the thermocline. So there have been several models that have built on this, theoretical models that have built on this. I'm showing one here by uh, Thompson et al in 2016. So they presented a residual mean model in two basins of the global overturning circulation that allowed for zonal mass transport between basins via both the ACC and the Indonesian through flow. It was formulated as a, as a four layer box model and the closure of the overturning adiabatically in the Atlantic, as shown here on the left, 
versus in a more figure of eight type loop that involves um, transfer between basins and um, diapycnal upwelling in the Indo-Pacific. Um, which of those you see in the model depends on the amplitude of the overturning relative to the deep diffusivity. So these authors concluded that in the uh, present day uh, Atlantic, there was a minimal role actually for this uh, adiabatic um, setup, but this is very much still an open question with really important implications for tracer distributions, residence times, pathways, and of course the sensitivity of the overturning circulation to changed forcing. Um, other studies have addressed this multi-basin question using a reduced gravity or a two-layer approach. Um, Jones and Chessy had a nice paper um, using a two-basin model where the interface between layers was deeper in the Pacific-like basin than the Atlantic one, and that difference led to a geostrophically balanced exchange flow between the basins. Ferrari et al. took a similar approach um, and suggested that in the present-day uh, climate, the overturning circulation down here in yellow um, might be best uh, thought of as a combination of three circulations, an adiabatic circulation in the uh, Atlantic, a diabatic overturning um, in the Indo-Pacific, and then um, an interbasin circulation that exchanges water through the Southern Ocean uh, geostrophically between the two basins. Now, these multi-basin models reflect our growing appreciation that even if an adiabatic overturning is possible within the Atlantic, water mass transformation in the Indo-Pacific likely plays an important role in the buoyancy budget of the global overturning. All the models we've discussed so far have included the role of eddies in the Southern Ocean. You can see the little blue arrows here. Um, these eddies, of course, act to flatten ice picknels and oppose the wind-driven upwelling of, of North Atlantic deep water. So I just wanted to include one slide that highlights that eddies are equally important in the North Atlantic. So I thought I'd put in this uh, other nice schematic that Huey Graphics made for us which just illustrates our current paradigm for deep water formation in the high latitude North Atlantic, uh, based largely on theoretical papers by uh, Spall and Stranio that I've highlighted up here. It's clear now that although buoyancy loss takes place over large areas of the ocean, regions of deep convection are found in the interior, the downwelling that occurs, uh, the Eulerian downwellings has to occur on the boundary. And it's eddies that connect the regions of water mass transformation um, with the regions of downwelling. Another key role for eddies in the North Atlantic is in reconciling the opposing requirements of a north-south surface buoyancy gradient, which is going to generate a geostrophic zonal flow towards the eastern boundary and no normal flow into that boundary. This paper at the bottom by Chessy and Wolf um, goes some way to squaring the circle by showing how instability processes erode the eastern boundary density structure uh, and give northward convergence in a boundary, in a boundary current. So eddies playing a critical role there as well. I want to move on now to talk about AMOC variability, just a few slides on that. Um, we all know that the rapid mockery rate at 26 North has revealed large amplitude variability on all time scales. And theoretical models have played a role in both challenging and defending the ability of an array like uh, rapid mocker to capture long term trends. So I thought I'd just show this example focused on the role of um, eddies in low frequency AMOC variability at 26 North. In 2008, um, Carl Wunsch published a paper where he took the typical sea surface height variability in the western subtropical Atlantic, which reaches an RMS amplitude of about 16 centimetres. And he projected that onto vertical modes of horizontal velocity to show that the, the effect of eddies randomly sitting over the western endpoint of the geostrophic array like rapid could result in upper mid ocean transport variations with a, a root mean squared vari amplitude. Uh, variability of about 16 sphere drops in time series that looks like this, which of course could easily swamp any longer term AMOP signal. However, what we found when we looked uh, at the observations more closely is that really close to the western boundary, the amplitude of sea surface height variations dropped off. So that if you integrate right across the basin from right at the western boundary to the eastern boundary, the effect of eddies is in fact much smaller than this. And in this paper led by Torsten Kanzau, uh, we were able to understand this drop off in sea surface height in terms of uh, linear wave dynamics. In the context of rapid, the other thing that uh, theoretical and simple idealized models have, have been really useful for is to help us interpret the variability in the observed uh, AMOC time series. Anything which alters the density on the eastern or the western boundary of the North Atlantic, of course, can alter the AMOC. Um, and there's been a growing realization over the last couple of decades that 
that winds uh, may play a large role, obviously above the uh, uh, way beyond the Ekman role that we've been aware of for a very long time. And so I have a couple of slides here focused on the seasonal cycle. Um, there's a significant seasonal cycle in the AMOC transport at 26 North. It's in the geostrophic component and it appears to be governed by eastern boundary pressure anomalies. In this paper in uh, 2014, Zhao and Johns, uh, amongst other things, forced uh, a simple linear Rossby wave model with climatological seasonal cycle in, uh, in wind stress. Managed to show that it was the um, eastern boundary uh, wind stress curl that seemed to be dominating the, the thermocline variations, uh, the seasonal cycle in, in thermocline thickness in a two, in a two layer model. Um, and likely uh, dominating the seasonal cycle uh, at rapid. Now, this is followed up by another uh, lovely idealized paper by Yang in 2015. Um, what, what Yang did was insert walls in a two layer Atlantic model and showed that while it's likely true that it's the eastern boundary pressure anomalies that, that contribute large part of the seasonal cycle in meridional geostrophic transport at 26 north, the pressure at the eastern boundary is, is not necessarily forced by local wind stress curl at the African coast. Um, in this model, at least, it's the result of basin-wide adjustments to local and remote um, wind stress forcing. So what they propose is a, a meridional redistribution of water masses in each layer um, between the subtropical and subpolar gyres in response to seasonal variability in ECMON pumping. You can see from, from models like this that it's, uh, it's clear now that changes in the geostrophic contribution to the AMOC at 26 North and, and other latitudes often involve a complex um, oceanic adjustment to wind forcing. And I wanted to highlight this paper, um, Zhao and John's in a second 2014 paper, uh, where they showed that, that most of the observed interannual variability in overturning and its components at 26 North uh, up to that stage at least can be reproduced in a, in a linear two layer model forced only by winds. Um, Think was really telling. And then the last uh, slide I want to show is this one. And I just, just to remind me to make the point that uh, that reduced gravity 1.5 layer models have really um, provided quite a useful, simple analytical framework for exploring the different characteristics of AMOC variability generated by wind um, compared with uh, variability generated by surface buoyancy fluxes and the combined influence of the two. So there have been a range of, of models here, and, uh, but the one I'm showing here uh, was led by our postdoc at the time, Xiaoming Zai, who proposed an analytical theory for the interaction of wind stress and buoyancy fluxes associated with the North Atlantic Ocean, uh, North, sorry, the North Atlantic Oscillation in generating AMOC variability. So he constructed a volume budget for the upper branch of the AMOC, assuming fast boundary wave propagation and westward uh, Rossby wave propagation in the interior. And he found that the effect of stochastic wind forcing over the subpolar basin is integrated along Rossby wave characteristics. And so what that gives you in this model is uh, low frequency AMOC variability in the rest of the basin. Whereas in contrast, uh, North Atlantic oscillation related surface buoyancy fluxes more likely to excite stochastic variability directly on the western boundary, which could be subsequently com communicated into the ocean interior. So hopefully I've given you a flavour of some recent theoretical models, a very um, <laughs> small selection um, and convinced you that theoretical and conceptual models continue to play a useful role uh, in both articulating our current understanding of the overturning circulation, but also helping us to frame the kind of um, leading order questions that remain open about AMOC dynamics. Um, so I just want to close like we did in the paper by uh, outlining some of the remaining challenges that we think theory might be able to make a contribution to over the next uh, decade. It's always dangerous to do this kind of thing, but there you go. Um, so the, the first thing on the list here is uh, we think perhaps uh, theoretical models might be able to play a role in um, getting at what sets the mean strength of the residual overturning in the Southern Ocean. Now, it's clear that the Eulerian mean and the eddy-driven overturning cells uh, appear to be related largely to local winds, but it's not obvious yet, I'd say, what sets the residual overturning and how closely tied that, that has to be to North Atlantic buoyancy forcing. So this is, of course, linked to this question of, um, of an adiabatic overturning circulation. The second thing I've put on the list here is um, is potential for, um, for theory to help us understand the bewildering variety of AMOC uh, variability that's exhibited by ocean and climate models by, by trying to get at how it depends on the background state. I think we'll see 
uh, more of a proliferation of models that go beyond just looking at the ocean and uh, incorporate other aspects of the climate system, coupled ocean atmosphere models, theoretical models perhaps. And that, that might help to better describe the air-sea interaction, uh, which would have implications for our ability to represent AMOC stability, uh, perhaps a bit more realistically in these models. And then the final thing I've put on the list here is that I think theoretical models um, and conceptual uh, thinking will help us to uh, continue to help us to prioritize the most critical, often sub grid scale processes that we need to improve the representation of in numerical ocean circulation models and also play a role in helping us develop uh, the appropriate parameterizations. So recent examples of this are things like sub meter scale processes and also, of course, uh, um, deep overflows, uh, dense overflows. I put a question mark here. Um, by their very nature, theoretical advances are quite difficult to foresee. Uh, but what's certain is that, you know, at the moment there's an unprecedented amount of data being collected in the North Atlantic. I just put the OSNAP array up here to remind me to say that. Um, and I think what, what that means is there's never been such an exciting time to be thinking about how the Atlantic really works. Uh, and I'm sure that theoretical models will, will play um, uh, a role in understanding the observations we're collecting over the next decade and in formulating hypotheses that we can test with these observations and with future models. And I'll leave it there. Thank you so much, Helen. Uh, do we have any questions for her? And I see a question in the chat box by Sankey Lee. Is there a positive feedback that drives the AMOC variability or is AMOC variability simply driven by uh, the North Atlantic Oscillation? Is there a positive feedback? I don't know if Sankey's referring to a particular um, uh, paper here. Um, I don't. <laughs> I don't feel like it, like I can answer that question in general terms. Um, there may well be all kinds of feedbacks, and I don't really want to speculate. I, but what I would welcome is other people to offer views on that. Please, please do jump in. Anyone who wants to comment There's on that. Salt the salt advection feedback. Yeah, of Stop. course, and that could. Yeah, the NAO could could be activating that. Yeah. Did you have anything else in mind, Sunky? Let's see, uh, a couple of things. Oscillation. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that may be that may be playing a role. Yeah, yeah, that's definitely something to think about. It's not something that was built into that psi model particularly. Um, yeah. Do we have any other questions for Helen? Um, if I may, I might. Uh, I guess I should. Uh, I'd like to comment on this issue of uh, variability. Um, I've invited Quentin Jumet, who's on the broadcast, to co to talk about this, uh, so perhaps we'll follow up. But we did an ensemble of North Atlantic runs and found a significant fraction of the variability of the AMOC was intrinsic. We were able to produce a map of that, and um, a lot in, in several places, 40 40 percent in the near in the upper upper thousand meters. 40% of the observed or 40% of the model variability could be ascribed to intrinsic processes. Um, anyway, so so that's kind of a quick answer to that question. And there's a lot of detail, of course. It's interesting. Thanks, Bill. I see a question from Shane. Um, what current observational gaps would you like to see filled to help theoretical developments? Ooh. <laughs> oh, I'm not sure. Um... Yeah, I mean, I, personally, I still think we need to get a better handle on exchange between the boundary currents in the interior and um, observationally at high latitudes in the North Atlantic. Um, but uh, yeah, I don't know what else would be on my wish list. Anyone else out there want to want to offer up? Yeah, I see you thinking. Um, let's see, maybe we can go to another question while you come up with some ideas. Um, cause I do see a lot coming into the, into the chat. So another question by Martha Buckley, I am interested in the role of eddies in the North Atlantic. It seems that they influence where the downrolling occurs, but do they alter the mean strength of the AMOC and density coordinates slash water mass transformation? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, yeah, I, I guess I'd like, um, Mike or Paula to weigh in on that if they're on the call. I don't know if they are. Um, I think this eastern bounding issue means that they they are um, playing some role in water mass transformation in the in the mean. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I can make some comments. This is Mike's fault. Thanks, um, Mike. The uh, 
water mass transformation is a balance between the atmospheric forcing and lateral advection in the ocean, right? So in the interior of the gyre, the lateral advection, I think, is mainly carried by eddies. So um, the strength of the eddy flux or the ability of eddies to transport properties from boundary current into the interior uh, will, it's half of the equation that determines uh, the water mass properties. So if the boundary current were more stable, then you would have to have a larger density gradient to flux the same amount of heat to balance cooling in the interior. I should say density to balance buoyancy flux in the interior. So eddies do have an active role in determining the strength and the product of convection at high latitudes. Uh, let's move on to another question. Uh, Tim Delsol, do these theoretical advances suggest more effective ways to monitor the AMOC beyond the existing arrays? Um, so there's been a lot of um, a lot of uh, activity on that in terms of people you know thinking about whether combinations of sphere drip balance or um, simply using uh, SSH you can do that. You know the, the paper I talked about, the Kanzo paper I talked about, um, made it clear that you really have to go right across the basin, you know, to do your geostrophic calculation if you want to avoid this contamination by eddies, which made it clear that you, you can't really do that with. Altimetry, but there have been various papers. Eleanor is on the call. I noticed she's thought hard about this, about whether there's um, there's better or better, or cheaper, easier ways of doing of doing it than the way we're doing it at the moment. Um, maybe she wants to weigh in. I think the jury's still open, really, on that. Um, Eleanor, I'll give you a chance if you want to chime in. Uh, yes, I think I think altimetry will play a role in how we do this in the future, but there's still issues with what the altimetry is saying uh well it looks like it carries more variability than we think we have from the in situ observations and i think that's true both at osnap and rapid so it it carries the same variability or similar variability but there are issues with the magnitude it's interesting it's, thanks thanks Anna. but i think you know that is definitely somewhere where theoretical models could could um continue to to be involved in thinking about that, yeah. Thank you, Eleanor. Um, and I think we have time for one more question uh, from Rick Williams. Hi, Ellen. Can you comment more on the link to other property transports, such as temperature, where the upper ocean gyre and Ekman contributions are also important? Um. Yeah. I mean, I guess. Yeah. They're I'm trying to think of. Theoretical models that have included gyro circulations and things as well. Anyone else very welcome to weigh in if you know of one. But I think that's what we're going to see a move towards is away from this only average picture where we are starting to see more of the, you know, we might be able to take into account some of these gyro circulations um, and consequently say more about the property transports. Um, yeah, so it's not a very satisfactory answer. I think that's kind of in the in the works for the coming decade. That's the trend we're moving more towards. Great. I think that will conclude our webinar today. So uh, again, thank you so much, Helen, for taking the time to present at today's webinar. And thank you to everyone on the line for participating. The AMOC webinar series will be concluding next month uh, with a presentation from Hallie Kilborn on June 17th. So that's the final AMOC webinar we'll have. We'll get a sneak peek at the paper that the Paleo Task Team has been working on, linking historical and modern views of the AMOC. So hopefully we'll see you next month for our final AMOC webinar. And again, thank you so much, Helen, for your talk today.